So, hello. Let's start immediately this next session, which um, would be about the engine room of um, ocean enclosures. And what we will do together this afternoon, we also have Armin Linke connected to join the conversation soon, is to look at the, um, or explore the technical challenges of coordinating an artificial ocean ecosystem in aquariums, as well as um, the mechanics of conservation, oceanography, and marine governance. So one of the main questions that we wanna uh, face together would be how the life-giving condition of an aquarium or a marine protected area are created. And before presenting all the guests, um, let me just introduce a little bit the images that you see here. They are um, taken from a documentary which is called Construir Oceanos, um, to build oceans. And um, where, um, you know, what really um, interests me is the voc vocabulary that you can uh, see uh, that has been used in the, in the late 90s to describe the oceanarium here in Lisbon which is, um, well, it's already 20 years ago, right? But it is described as a gig gigantic factory. It is represented as a factory. So where the system is monitored 24-7, 367 days a year, and where the artificial paradise is made possible by the use of biological and mechanical filters, valves, pumps, and pipes, acrylic glass, that need to be cleaned, and they define the clothes, that specific place, space, or paradise um, as a closed word. Indeed, the history of the 20th century um, of architecture, design, and engineering is strongly related and linked to the conceptualization and the production of closed system, closed system, for the sustenance of life in hostile environments to humans. But those futuristic projects, and we can mention some, like for example, villages and capsules to live underwater, for instance, or on Mars, other planets in general, insisted in the reproduction of um, synthetic naturalism, um, wherein the laws of nature are displaced from the domain of wilderness to the domain of cities and buildings. But if today we admit um, that our life is tied to the one of others, and I think that the virus told us exactly that, um, in a relation of interdependence, right, of uh, mutual vulner vulnerability, then immediately becomes a relational circumstance and an open system of possibilities and not a closed system anymore. So therefore the aquarium as a concept um, in the way we try to formulate it today can be seen as an interface to redesign the notion of proximity with nature by surpassing the logics of extraction and domination and by being seen as an opportunity to redesign our common environment. So let me introduce very briefly our guest um, uh, today, and then I will give immediately the word to Emmanuel Gonzalves. Uh, welcome here. Uh, Emmanuel is a, an associate professor at ISPA, the Instituto Universitario in Lisbon. Um, he is also vice um, president of MARE, Marine and Environmental Sciences Center. He's a member of the board of directors of Ocean Authority Foundation and a member of the National Council for the Environment and Sustainable Development. He was the deputy head of the task group for marine affairs, which developed Portugal's ocean strategy and the lead negotiator for the European Union in the CBD COP, which approved the EBSA's criteria, ecologically or biologically significant marine areas. His research interests are marine conservation, marine spatial planning, and um, marine protected areas, marine ecology, as well as marine ecology. Has been involved in the designation and implementation of MPAs in Portugal 
and elsewhere, including discussions on the conservation of the high seas. He has developed, together with co-authors, a new regulation-based classification system for, for MPAs and is author or co-author of over you know, 60 papers and so on and so on, but well, <laughs> it's, you know, a, a very overwhelming, um, you know, experiences you have in, in the context of marine protected areas. Okay, I do the same with all of, of the guests, so then we can immediately go um, into the, our conversation. So Miguel Tiago de Oliveira, welcome. Miguel is Director of Operations, Quality Assurance, Environmental, Safe and Security and Social Responsibility at the Oceanario. So you will be like our you know, insider from which to discuss uh, some topics that regard the engine rooms or the backstage of the Oceanarium today. He has a wide-ranging leadership expertise in scientific research, commercial management, operations and quality, environmental and social corporate responsibility. A lot of years of professional experience, 25 in total, is, we say, in diverse roles within world-class um, zoological, educational and conservation institutions, including comprehensive conceptual design, construction, project management, biological and life support planning and maintenance, commercial, uh, commercial operations, regulatory affairs, safety and security information, IT management, stakeholder management and governance. But just to mention that he's also an active participant in several associative non-profit organizations related to conservation, education and sports. And now we also have, and maybe we can um, uh, give access to Armin as well. Hello, Hello, Armin. Hi. Hello, welcome here. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> I will introduce you too. So Armin, um, for over 20 years, has explored the question of how humanity uses technologies and knowledge in order to transform the surface of the earth and adapt it to its needs. So his film and photo photographs document human-made changes on land, at sea, and throughout the entire biosphere. Together with Giulia Bruno, has produced the film Oceanarium as a new piece commissioned by the MAT. You can find it in the exhibition Aquaria. And we will also comment on some images taken from the film um, later and together. Um, Armin has a lot of experience as a, you know, as a professor in many different universities and institutions like ISEA in Urbino, um, Italy, but also um, he has been a research affiliate at the MIT Visual Art Program at Cambridge University and guest professor at the UF Art and Design University in Venice, Karlsruhe University Art and Design, and his um, experience go far beyond um, all this and uh, we can find his own work in uh, several um, institutions like the Maxi in Rome, um, ZKM in Karlsruhe, uh, the PAC in Milan and, um, and also um, in several biennials like Istanbul Biennial among others. So, okay. Uh, again, welcome, sorry for this very long introduction, but I think now we are ready to start our conversation. I will just give you, um, Emmanuel, the, the stage, so you can um, present. Thank you very much, Angela. Uh, thank you very much for the kind and long introduction. <laughs> but um, I'll, I'll try to, to bring to you some perspectives on marine conservation, and I'm really pleased to be here, and thank you very much for the invitation to exchange our views. So if, if I can have my presentation, please. Um, I would like to start, let me see what do I need to point, okay. Uh, by maybe asking the questions of what is marine, what are marine protected areas, because we talk many times about these, but um, sometimes it's not easy to have a concept. Uh, Luckily, IUCN has solved this um, a while ago, although the concept is always evolving. But uh, the way we use this expression in society is not consistent. So IUCN um, definition of a marine protected area gives the, all, all the elements that we need to try to understand these spaces. 
Uh, so there are spaces, geographical spaces, which are recognized. Recognized means that people understand them and uh, uh, respect them. They are dedicated and managed somehow. Can be through legal means, can be through um, other um, social uh, acceptance ways. Uh, but the main point is that they are done to achieve the long-term conservation of nature. And so this is the main difference between marine protected areas and other management tools that we have in the ocean, is that these areas are directly to the long-term conservation of nature, and of course then with the, both the natural and cultural values that come with that. And so the second question is, why do we need them? Uh, why do we need these spaces? Why do we need to put these areas in place? And um, very, well, using an image, I don't know where to point, yeah, okay. Using an image to try to synthesize a lot of information, this is why we need marine protected areas. We need them because we are destroying the planet. And we are destroying the planet at a pace which is much higher than the pace that the planet can replenish itself. And so we have now the knowledge to understand what we have done essentially in the last century, century and a half. And that knowledge has been um, oh, okay. synthesized on, um, in 2018 and 19 on these very, very important reports that came from the United Nations, both on climate but also on biodiversity that um, bring, brought all the scientific information together and gave society the knowledge to act. Of course, science has been calling to, for action for a long time. Um, at least since the 70s, we know the climate issue was coming um, and, uh, and, and the same with the biodiversity crisis. But these reports now gave us the tools so that at least from the society point of view and from the policy point of view, we cannot claim any more that we don't know. And what do we know? We know essentially that we are facing two existential crises. And these are crises because they have the dimension of affecting the whole planet and the whole societies. We are facing a climate emergency, and it's an emergency because we have a very short time to act. But we are also facing a less known uh, aspect of the impacts of humans on the planet, which is a species extinction crisis. The IPBS report that you see there has calculated that we have one million species at risk of disappearing in the next few decades. And if you understand that we know around 2.7 million species, and we calculate that there will be around 8.5 million species on the planet, you understand what we are talking about. So our model of development, our model of um, uh, the way we build our societies post Second World War was or led us to this crisis, which are recent. And this is also another important point. These problems are not problems that we have been facing for centuries or ages that our societies have adapted to. These problems are recent problems that we are still trying to find ways to address. And very briefly going through the two uh, challenges, the climate emergency is a triple threat in what respects the ocean because the ocean is becoming warmer. It absorbs more than 90% of the excess heat which is produced by the pollution that we put in the atmosphere, essentially CO2 or other uh, greenhouse gases. But it's also becoming more acidic because the ocean also absorbs about a quarter of the CO2 that goes to the atmosphere, of this excess CO2, that when it enters the water, um, it will acidify those waters. And it's also becoming, we recently understood, with less oxygen, because warmer oceans capture less oxygen, but also because eutrophication and other problems are um, lowering the levels of oxygen on the, on the, on the ocean. And he, this has a cascading effect at the whole ocean ecosystem and the whole planetary uh, system uh, as, as a whole. But as you know, the ocean is the, the great climate regulator. And so if the ocean is not functioning well, we should expect problems and we are having problems as we all know. Um, so in face of this knowledge, what are we doing today? This is also important for us to understand. We know that we have a a Paris climate agreement. So the states have already um, decided that something needs to be done. 
uh, and that something is to try to keep warming at 1.5 degrees related to pre-industrial levels. But today, as we speak, we are already at 1.2. So we have a very, very short um, addition to made, which is 0 0.3. And this is where we, are, where we need to go is this green line that you see over here. So this is the historical levels of greenhouse gases. And we need to shift gear, as you can see. We need to completely invert the current situation. If you look at the Paris Agreement and where we are today, we are at this um, blue line over here. So we are looking at a situation where by the end of the century, we will have 2.5 to 3.2 degrees warming. And we don't know what planet is, a planet with 2.5 to 3.2 degrees warming. It's a completely different planet from the one we have today. And so this is why it is an emergency. It's because we have a very, very short window. If we overshoot this window, we will not be able to achieve 1.5 because the carbon budget, which will be already on the atmosphere, is too large for us to be able to do that. And this is why it is an emergency. We need to act now or otherwise we will not get there. Then on the species extinction crisis and in what regards the ocean, many times people don't realize how great the impact of the human impacts on the ocean are, how great the changes are. And in fact, science is showing us this. There are only around 13% of the ocean which is left intact, which means that it has all the components of a healthy system. So the rest, 87%, is being impacted in one way or the other by different human activities. And this is an overwhelming thought if you, if you think about it, because you know, we, we thought historically of the ocean as too large, too big to be impacted by humans. And here it is, science is clear and is showing exactly where we are. But it's also showing that large parts of the ocean are highly impacted by human activities. So all the reds and oranges that you see on this map are areas which are deeply degraded, which means that they don't have predators or they don't have um, some of the important components of this system so that they can work properly. And this is the reason behind the species extinction crisis. Of course, we are also doing this in land, as you all know, but um, I, will, I will stick to the ocean. Uh, an example of these impacts is the big predators. And the big predators in all oceans, as you can see over there, are um, reduced to around 10% of what these populations used to be before industrial fishing started. So before around 60 to 70 years ago. So in this very, very short time, we are able to reduce the populations of all these predators to just 10% of what we, they are. So essentially, what are we managing today in the oceans? We are managing these third systems. We are not managing nature, we're not managing, not managing wildlife. We are managing systems that are um, with serious problems. And we need to face these serious problems with solutions which could be uh, adapted to the problems that we have. And there are two critical changes that need to happen. And we know that. We need very, very soon to de decarbonize our economy overall, because if we don't do that, the climate is never going to be um, the climate issue is not, never going to be solved. But we also need to be able to save nature and to restore nature. And for that to happen, nature needs to be valued. And we can discuss then a little bit what, what we mean by value and how can we value nature in our systems. And this brings us to three urgent solutions in terms of the oceans. With 13.2% left of the wild wilderness, and of that wilderness, around only 4% is in marine protected areas, we need to save what's left. So we, need how to, we know how to do this and we, need, we know where to do this. But this is not enough, because if we just save what's left, we have a very, very small percentage of the ecosystems which are intact. So we need to bring re restoration into the equation and we need to rebuild what we have already destroyed. And finally, we need to change our ways. We cannot continue to do the same things and expect a different result from the one that we have done so far. So how can marine protected areas help to face these problems? Um, currently, this is where we are. We have around 7% of the ocean 
in some form of protection, but less than 2%, which are fully protected, which means where uh, activities, um, extractive activities are not allowed. And we also know that internationally we are heading to an agreement to try to protect 30% of the ocean by 2030. We also know that the ocean is not all the same. So we need to prioritize these areas and science already tells us where are the areas where this 30% can make a bigger difference. But again, if you think about this, this still means that we are lift, leaving 70% out. And of course, if we leave 70% out and continue to do things that the way we are doing today, the 30% of protection is not going to solve the problem. So MPAs is just one of the solutions. It's a very important one, but it's not the whole story. The good news is that we know that they work. When they are put in place with effective means, we'll have more fish, we'll have larger fish, we'll have more biomass, we'll have more species in areas which are protected. And of course, the ocean doesn't have frontiers. It's not boxed in, the, in that sense. And so all these animals are going to move around and they'll move around to areas where they can be fished. But it's critical that we have these areas in place so that we can not only protect what's left, but we can also rebuild what has been degraded. And the good news is that the ocean responds and responds like this. This is a dive I did about four or five years ago in Mexico, uh, in Baja, in a place where 20 years ago it was a desert. The fish has been taken out of the ocean and the community decided to protect this area and to try to use it by to, for tourism. And this is how it looks today. It's uh, completely transformed, uh, filled with fish, and that community today is doing really, really well in terms of their development because they had made this choice of making uh, an option between having a thriving nation and having also uh, nature and having also a thriving economy. And this is possible, and we have examples of this in many, many places. Okay, so we know that they work, but we also know that we need to make it right. So uh, the ocean animals and ocean life has complex life cycles, and these life cycles have to be incorporated in those solutions. So we need to take care of where are all these parts of the cycle going, and if we are able to protect them. We also know that they have different dispersal distances, so we know size matters. Small MPAs can only protect a small part of the uh, web of life. We know that they move in different distances. Some species stay put, they stay where they are the whole, their whole life, others will move a lot. And so, again, the solutions need to be adapted to the biology and the ecology of these species. Um, <clears throat> we know that, <clears throat> and this is counterintuitive many times, that we need to leave the largest fish in the ocean. Because if we leave the largest fish in the ocean, they will produce proportionally much more young than smaller fish. You can see the difference on a sea bass just of 20 centimeters from 40 to 60 and 60 to 80, the number of young is exponentially larger. And not just that, these younger are much, uh, um, much more uh, able to survive because they have uh, eggs which have more uh, nutrients. So again, this is the type of information that we know today that bring us, bringing to conservation can bring us the best results of that conservation. And here is a meta-analysis showing that they work. When these areas which are fully protected are in place, you'll have large increases in biomass, in density, in size, and diversity. And uh, this is a subtle scientific um, case, if you want. There's lots of variability. It depends a lot on uh, the, the, the mechanisms of implementation. But we know that if we protect the ocean, we'll, of course, decrease mortality, especially by fishing. And by this, we will increase the uh, biodiversity inside the MPA. But we also know that these effects spill over to the, to the outside. So we'll have also more species and more um, adults, uh, larvae and, and eggs at the outside. The fact that we know this scientifically doesn't mean that uh, this is what we are doing in the ocean today. In fact, many of the marine protected areas that exist in the ocean, 94% of those marine protected areas allow fishing. And some of them have higher levels of fishing inside the marine protected areas than outside. So we have a, a tool that works, but we are not using that tool effectively or 
adequately in most cases, and certainly not in Europe, which we have all this information uh, that is coming. But again, the good news is that we know what is effective. We know that large MPAs, old, fully or highly protected, well-enforced, well-regulated, with a good governance model, which is critical, accepted by, the, 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 by people, and uh, with a, uh, a mechanism in place that uh, works, which are integrated in networks, they work. And they can produce the results of that protection. I'm just going to, to finalize by showing you some examples of what we mean by protecting the ocean. What we mean is that we are protecting these species that you are going to see on these slides. And I'm going to name these species. So here we have a lionfish, um, in, the, in this case in Indonesia, a seahorse here in, uh, in Portugal, a scorpion fish in the Azores, this parrotfish in the Maldives, Batfish okay. in Thailand. And did you send the uh, fish among the uh, black corals? Yes, Lizardfish, right some frogfish, and a tiger shark. And if you pay attention for all the names that I named these fish, tiger, hawk, bat, these are all terrestrial names. So we don't have a lexicon for marine life. We just use what is familiar to us as terrestrial animals, and we try to bring these to marine life. And this is part of the problem of the disconnect we have with the ocean that allow or bring society to have less attention on the protection of the ocean than we do. Um, I could continue forever, but just some more examples. Jewel, anemones, sea fans, um, pipefish, feather duster worm, okay? These are all hammerhead sharks. Again, these are all objects or features which are familiar to humans, porcelain crabs, clownfish, um, and we are, because of that, bringing what is, again, familiar to us somehow. Well, we can understand why do we anthropomorph anthropomorphize many times when we see images like this, because we somehow connect emotionally to the things that we connect, and we disconnect, especially to the things that we don't see that are underwater. Um, of course, when you, you are in the water with these uh, sperm whales, such as the ones we have encountered in, in this expedition in the Azores, it's impossible not to be emotionally connected. But this doesn't happen to everyone. Not everyone can see these. And so we have this problem to, of acceptance to solve. And let me just um, maybe finish here uh, showing you this image of an animal that you all know. And uh, if um, there is a word that we would like to attach to this animal, I think that it would be this one, okay? So when we think about lions, we think about wildlife. We think about these big natural systems where nature thrives. And now let me give you an example of another predator, this time an ocean predator, and also put a, no a word next to it when we see that animal. And probably the word that we're thinking about is this one. So we immediately shifted from the heart to the belly, if you want, from the heart to the stomach. We stopped thinking emotionally on connecting with the lion, and we start thinking with a, a different organ, if you want, when you think about the tuna. And this disconnect also is part of the problem we need to face if we are to be able to solve the issue of ocean conservation and to solve the two existential crises that I told you about. I have some more, a few more slides to, to go through, but I think I'll finish here and we can discuss uh, a little bit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emmanuel for the presentation, which I think uh, puts already some, you know, concepts we, we can um, um, discuss together. Hi, Armin. So no. um, let's do that. Let's um, go ahead with the second part of the presentation where we will um, comment together some of the pictures that are taken from the backstage of the Oceanarium. Um, we have the author. So I ask you to comment these images from your own perspective. So we have the perspective of 
of the artist, of the author, with a special point of view and, and a special, you know, lens. We have um, um, you uh, with the, with all the expert expertise yeah. you can get. But also, let's try also to see if we can make together some parallelism with the design and let's go into the, the concept of designing, you know, design and designing and imagining uh, marine protected areas and their own and, and the, um, well, an interpretation we can apply to them. Okay, so who will start commenting this image? So I, I, I might start. Yeah. This, this is an image, a very early images from our aquarium in, Lis in Lisbon. That's the one of the main tank of the aquarium. And how do related with the connection that we need to do to the oceans? The aquariums, it, it really does make sense to have aquariums on these times. It's grabbing fish and putting on the aquariums. It's kind of odd. It's, should we do that as, as biologists? Should we take animals and, and bring them to captivity to show to the people? Mm -hmm. And many of us would say, mm, Maybe not. Maybe this really does make a lot of sense. But how many of you have saw these images that Emmanuel shows to you? Most of, I would say most of us on this room, maybe me and Emmanuel have, have the privilege to go on the oceans and to observe this wildlife. And maybe for us, the tuna fish that you saw is not food or sushi, but it's, 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 it's wildlife. It's, and aquariums bring these to the people. Aquariums um, bring democracy, brings the sense of uh, discovering the, what is behind the water, what is below the lines. Okay. So bring these people to, to aquariums and to see such a large aquarium like this allows them to not diving, but be surrounding of what we see. So somehow people start to, to protect what they love. And that's the biggest goal, I would say, that we need to have on the aquarium. It's yeah, so it's that emotional link that also Manuel w was talking about. Definitely. Even if I have a, a, a kind of note, um, a side note, that because you, Emmanuel, were talking before about the climate emergency and topic of extinction and so on. But then when we go there and we are exactly in, the, in that plan uh, where Peter Chemoyev, the architect of the Oceanarium is pointing, you have an image of um, you know, the ocean, which is maybe a little bit fictional because it's not exactly what you can find or discuss when you discuss all the problematicity that we are facing as a society uh, in a global scale. Um, for the state of the oceans. But I, I, I agree that there is this emo emotional connection that is really needed to get people close to the topic. But let's give a voice to Armin. Uh, yes, so for, for me, I mean, it, it was very um, fortunate that, that Peter uh, Kermayev showed us this map, but it was also super interesting when we were at the, at the aquarium, really to understand what we had to film uh, because it's, it's a very complicated, it's a kind of a kaleidoscope also, the, the aquarium, because it has many facets in which you look in, into the, into the space. So, so sometimes we, we really needed a map at the beginning, as we would uh, enter, let's say, an island, or if we would uh, enter a complicated, somehow a kind, a kind of spaceship. Uh, uh, so uh, th this map is, is the map of the aquarium, but for me it's also a geopolitical map, no? Because what, what uh, Peter Chemayev explained us in, in the interview that is also in the exhibition is that uh, you, the, the aquarium is also um, a theater of climates. So you have four climates and you have five oceans. And the center ocean is a kind of theater. It's a kind of casting of all the oceans uh, brought together. And so this map is also um, like a, a scenography like you would have in Baroque theaters of the, of the 16th centuries, but also the, uh, that you would have in, in other forms of, of theaters that I also learned from, from your research, uh, uh, 
uh, Angela, really that, that this idea of, of the aquarium has a, a very long tradition. And, um, and also I looked at a, at a book that came, that was, came out three years ago, Architecture and Science uh, of Globes. And it's also interesting to, to look, uh, to hear the names of this tradition of theaters where nature is rep represented or the earth is uh, represented, like the Newtonian Centaphone, the Georama, the Maparium, the Planetarium, the Temple de la Terre, the Pan Cosmos, the Pantheon, the Uranium, the National Botanical Gardens, the Aerial Globe, the Periscopic Theater, the Forecast Theater of Lewis Richardson. That is, by the way, uh, a map that uh, already developed in the 30s that would uh, forecast the future of climate uh, and climate change. Yeah, sure. It connected very well to something that has been discussed this morning too about boxing as a way of um, classifying or you know contain worlds uh, or a way of world making and in this in this case uh, it's very clear but so i um pass you the mic just because how do you design a marine protected area is it contained is it how the boundaries are defined do i see the boundaries at the sea or it's just like something designed on the map hmm. yeah thank you angela well there are there are several ways to do it uh, definitely the there will be lines uh, because those lines have differences between inside and outside yeah okay ideally we should not need marine protected areas which would mean that the ocean was healthy but the fact that we need them um, we need to box them in a sense okay but again this is the struggle that we have been doing in the conservation community for i would say a long time is that that only works if outside we will have also sustainable uses of the ocean because uh, you know the problem with conservation is that inversion of the burden of proof and so it is the it is the conservation that you have that has to prove that works okay. rather than having the human activities needing to prove that they are sustainable and if you invert this logic then actually the approach that we should have been in implementing is that the whole ocean should be protected and then we should open specific areas yeah oh, that is super uses. interesting and yeah so you this, reverse the this is the complete, this is what you should do if okay. you if you were a rational if you're a rational extraterrestrial sure. arriving on earth and under, and trying to come up with a, a smart solution for the ocean that this i would say would be the one yeah we, we call it like a litmus test no for mm -hmm. yeah understanding a procedure okay let's go ahead armin um yeah i just changed uh, images that you prepared angela and uh, yeah here there, there is um, what I also liked, in, and I already said that, um, uh, yeah, the, one of the devices that is very interesting for me is this um, acrylic, uh, acrylic um, surface uh, that somehow was the, the, the invention or the, the, the chemical invention, or the technical invention that made possible that uh, Basically, we can look into into the water without the water and all the pressure of the water breaking the glass. And I also had to think that I mean there is something similar also in photography, but maybe this is ro technical romanticism. That uh, photography, the first plates where emulsions were put uh, on glasses, and then at a certain moment, um, uh, yeah, the, the emulsion now was put on on plastic on acrylic too, and in a certain way the the, the the yeah the whole aquarium works like a, a kind of cinema in which the public uh, is uh, looking in um, but at the same time it also works like a, a, a panopticum uh, i mean uh, a, a form of imprisonment uh, in which in a certain way the public is in the dark so it doesn't create uh, reflections but also uh, yeah, there is a kind of guardian that from from top can look into uh, into into the basin. Um, yeah, so, I, 
Sorry if I intervene. Yes, that's true. Maybe it's good to mention, nice to mention, that actually the first domestic aquaria has been intended as the first TV in the houses um, of bourgeois families in London. For example, there were no TV at that time and no cinema. So the first, the first form of public you know, cinema um, has been the aquarium, the public aquarium. So this is a very nice thing to mention. But I mean, um, could you go to the next, please? And I will give um, the, yeah, I would ask you to comment on this. So what are we looking here? What are well, uh, an aquarium differently to the sea, it's a cl closed, small space. Mm. Even our aquarium there is quite large, for the biolo there is on the aquaria, it's quite a uh, small area. So we need to provide systems, life support systems that really keep up the water. So, and, and I always say that fish has, has a design problem. They, they, they <laughs> poop on the same water that they breathe. So, so if we don't clean, the, the, the toxins will be built up and the water will be become uh, a death trap to, to the fish who, who, live, who live there. So we need to, every single day, there is a, a, a huge cleaning process. We need to vacuum the, the, the sand, to clean the glasses, to clean the filters, to allow all these life to, to, to postpone and to, to be uh, well kept uh, and healthy, basically. Um, just a quick note to, to the previous slide. There, you saw like that huge acrylic window and many aquariums you can see acrylic windows are very sensitive if you if you get close or with a baby car you can scratch quite easily it's not like glass it's much more uh, plastic yeah. um, we don't have any protections to these windows and the reason is we want to put as closer the our visitors to to the wild so we really believe if you are immersed and if you feel a connection, and, and this connection is, is higher if you don't have any, any natural barriers, like if you don't have a guard or if you don't have a, a, a pathway, uh, we can increase this connection. And if we increase this connection, people can, when leave the aquarium are more passionate about the seas and they can also go further, study and protect the oceans. So this is the reason that we really try to have our aquarium quite neat, quite clean, for a healthy point of view, but also to make it possible to people get closer and, and enjoy the, the, this, the experience, this connection. Okay, uh, is allowed to the uh, to the audience to see these scenes normally when they visit the Australarium, or this is something the maintenance of the space and the tanks is something that happen only in, during closing time? No, we, we, Every single day we start, to, our biology team starts to work at 7, 7.30 in the morning, mm -hmm. and we only open at 10. Mm -hmm. But, um, so I would say the major cleaning process are doing off times. Yeah. But uh, several times a day you can see divers into, going into the, to the aquariums, cleaning or feeding. And so it, it's not maybe with these so many pipes on the water, but mm -hmm. it's possible to see our diving and our cleaning process right. as, 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 a, as a visitor. Okay, well. thank you. I mean, you mentioned once that um, that this sort of image and scene um, was suggesting you something that you have seen at the Star City near Moscow. Could you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so for me it was very interesting to see um, uh, the, the effort uh, done here at the Oceanarium. It remembered me an exercise that I had the possibility to photograph uh, while the Mir space station was still existing. And it was a team of uh, French and the Russian and American astronauts uh, making a rehearse on how to repair an antenna at the at this space station. And basically they would rehearse also in water to uh, to have this condition of, um, of non-gravity. And uh, yeah, and it seemed, it seemed to me very, very similar, this, this moment of having, uh, let's say, a, a replica of, um, of a specific uh, uh, area, of a specific piece of nature. I mean, you could say in space also it's empty, but 
it's it's part of nature uh like astrophysics would say that uh, astrophysical event, event is part of nature um and uh, yeah so but it also remembered me other exercises i filmed in trondheim at the at the technical university uh, where for example they rehearse uh, technology for oil platforms or for deep sea mining so you would have uh, uh, scuba divers uh, having little tests on uh, rovers that would uh, then be used possibly in future uh, deep sea mining. So this is also uh, interesting that maybe in, in this absurdity of that some of this technology then is maybe um, mm, yeah developed uh, somewhere else for for reasons that are uh, yeah the the um that are the the, the reverse of, of conservation somehow thank you very much um next please this is like the next image uh, yeah is the image i would like you two to command together so from one side i would like to know from um from miguel um what does it mean um, you know, to think about the climatic control and life support system inside the Australian And then after, I would like to ask Emmanuel if you have a control room or what is a control room of uh, an MPA, for example? Well, for, for the aquarium, we have each tank is, is there is a huge technology um, life support system yeah. supporting it and it's controlled in this room. So we have like an integrated system, control system. Uh, all, all the aquariums are uh, controlled at once on this space. And it, it's, if you imagine, if, if you know how is your pool in home, there, there is a small pump and valves and mm -hmm. so extrapolate that to a huge factory to it. it that's what we control here. So we need the, to set up the valves. We need to f control the pH of the water. The, all, 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 the, all the situations, all the levels, and, and in this room with two or three persons uh, as a, a shift, we can control it. Otherwise, we would have like to have a team of maybe with 50 persons doing it manually. Yeah. So, so I would say this is the heart of the life support system of the aquarium. And here we have a glimpse of all the tanks in a, in a, in a, a monitor. Yeah. So it's, I would say not playing God, but it's playing like a, the chief engineering of a, of a big factory, so. What does a change of temperature could provoke inside one of the tank? You, you can kill all the fishes on it or all the animals. Okay, good. So <laughs> temperature, pH, salinity, all, all these mm -hmm. uh, things are very stable mm -hmm. in the seawater because it's a huge mass on, on the ocean. When you bring, when you try to replicate these in a small aquarium, changes are quite easy to happen. Yeah. So you need to control them and to, to always working like on a f f negative feedback. So when things are increasing, you have to make it going down and, and it's like always like this. So temperature goes like this and you make, make sure that it's on track. Salinity goes like this and you make sure that it's on track. So, it's it's a quite a it's it's quite it's a con, it's a continuous balance between yeah, it's, yeah, it's keep parameters the balance. that keep need the to be controlled. Yeah. How these parameters are <clears throat> controlled and monitored mm. in an MPA? Okay, well, and a couple of things. One is that each MPA is a case, so it's very different to control a, a large scale MPA in the okay, middle of the ocean. Okay, let's say a protected and a, a coastal, full protected area. A coastal one near shore is. So the, the, yeah. the controls, if you want, or the, the levels are, are different. The second thing is that there are similarities. There are similarities in the sense that um, you, need to, you need to know what you're aiming at. So your objectives mm -hmm. are critical because if you don't have them, then you don't know where you, what you're trying to aim. Then you have to have a system in place that um, um, has zoning, if you want. So different zones allow different types of uses. You have to allow these zones to have regulations so that people understand what are the rules of use. 
Then you have to have monitoring systems in place to see if the MPA is working or not. Are there more fish? Are there larger fish? Are the species uh, What are these healthy? technologies or devices? Um, can you describe them? Just yeah. to say, okay, I'm in the water, I see something, mm -hmm. and then I will recognize that this yeah. is like a device yeah. so it's monitoring a, on that. It's a, always, you know, when you're, when you're monitoring, you're always simplifying complex reality. Mm -hmm. So you use indicators, yeah. okay? So indicators are the key because of course you cannot monitor everything. But you can, by these indicators, assess what's going on with the system. And then, as with your car, when you drive your car, you have a very, very complex system behind it. But uh, sometimes it's just a light that pops up and you know, okay. oh, I have an mm -hmm. alert, mm -hmm. now I need to find out what's going wrong. Whereas other times it's continuous, such as your speed or your tank because those are critical aspects. With MPAs, it's the same. You need monitoring systems that allow you to know if species are uh, going up numbers, the numbers are coming down, mm. if the elements of those species allow you to infer that the system as a whole is working, is functionally working. For instance, if the predators are there, if they are intact, if the herbivores or the different types of species, which elements are present. And so you have these um, monitoring systems in place which can be translated in very different types of tools. Sometimes it's putting divers in the water and taking uh, numbers of fish, sizes of fish, yeah. simplest way. Others is taking videos or photos and then interpreting them. Okay, it's mostly about species. It's about species, but yeah. it's about the water quality. Yeah, it's about, sure. so it depends mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. where you are. Okay. Um, you also have new technologies coming, for instance, to understand if that these areas are being respected in the high seas. You have satellites, you have a positioning system of ships. You can infer the behavior of the fishing ships by their positioning system with uh, artificial intelligence. So there are a suite of the technologies that today are available to okay. control Help in moni the monitoring and to all allow the conditions. Them. Okay, yeah. okay. So I think, um, yeah, we have 10 minutes. So why you don't, for example, Miguel and Armin, uh, choose one image of which you would like to talk about? So um, can you go next? Okay. This is one of the, I really like mm. this. Yeah. Um, uh, do you choose this? <laughs> no. <laughs> this is our cultural room, and, and it, it's a small area, but it's uh, for people who visit us. This is like off limits. It's m most of the time, most of the people don't see this. And um, this is our cultural room. You, the, what you see there, it's a small medusa, it's a Philoviza puntata, which he has all the, the life cycle to display on the, you know, in the main exhibit. But it's, to see them here, it's, it's, it's really cool and it's really to, there is a easy way to connect. Uh, it, it's, it, it looks like a, a space science. It's really awkward. It's, the feeling of this room, it's really, it, 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 you don't seem that you are in an aquarium, you seem that you are somewhere yeah. behind reality. So it, it's, it's a kind of tricky, uh, well, it's a special place for breeding them, right? And then yeah. they are moved into a tank. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if you don't have any comment, you can um, yeah. go ahead. I think this is an image that tackles a very good topic, mm -hmm. yeah. which is the one of conservation, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would like you to comment on the fact that if does it exist or not, the collaboration between the activity you do at the Oceanarium or the idea of conservation you also apply to MPAs and so on. There is any thread of collaboration and what does it mean in terms of, um, yeah, again, conservation and uh, preservation? Yeah, so I, I think, again, um, that um, aquariums are central tools for mm. conservation because, okay. as Miguel was saying, we need we need to reach people, mm. you know? We, we only move by the things that um, uh, make us touched emotionally. Yeah. That's where we decide that we need to do something, is when 
there is some, you know, inner movement inside us that say, okay, I'm, I'm connected. And most people are not connected by, with mm. the ocean. Okay. So if you want marine protected areas to be effective, they need to be accepted. And for them to be accepted, people need to understand why we are putting them in place. Mm. And aquariums are critical tools to do that because you connect people with, through aquariums emotionally so that people know the beauty of the ocean, know uh, the, these emotional connecting connections with life. And then when you show them why marine protected areas are needed because of the situation that I explained where we are today, then we can have this transformational change. Because, you know, in the end, this is all about decisions. This is all about decisions by us as consumers, all about decisions by policymakers when mm -hmm. they make the laws. All yeah, I understand. Of, I understand. You know, and uh, and uh, this is totally clear. But if we look at these pictures, okay. it's about the eggs uh, that has been collected from mm -hmm. a tank. Yeah. Okay. What does it happen after? So you so, monitor the eggs and then when they born? Well, th these are uh, teleos larvae, so it's, they, traditionally they are very hard to, to, to make them grow on, on the, within the aquarium. Mm -hmm. So they, hard, they are hard to, to, to feed and um, most of them they don't, they don't survive. So, but it, but it seems it's something that we, we are working more and more and more, mm -hmm. and we are already successful for some species. It, basically, the idea is to, for, for one side, it's you, the aquarium industry, it's, it's all connected, so it's not oceanarism, it doesn't live by itself. We are connected with all other aquariums in the Europe and the United States and China and all over the world. And we, we, we change animals and we, we breed animals all together to, to, to keep, to make sure that the populations that are in captivity, they have the, the gene pool of the population is strong enough mm. to have a healthy population. So I'll give a quick example. If I breed my sea otters, mm. sea otters are, are acute, they're, they're, they're mammals, so everybody connects with sea otters. Um, if I breed them with, within my installation, between themselves, I would have like a, a very red population because mm. I would breed the sisters with brothers, mm. brothers with mothers, mm. and that the, the, the gene pool of the population would be not as good. So what we do is we grab our, our puppies, send to other aquariums where there is another male that can breed with the, f the female and provide uh, Future okay. babies to another aquarium. To another That's aquarium. why you exchange. And, and, and if we have these healthy populations, I give the example of the sierras, where we could talk, be talking about penguins, birds, some fishes. If we do this, we have like a strong population that if we need to provide to maybe to uh, yeah to some marine to protected, some marine protected areas, areas, when they there are. will be a, a good gene pool population to. To, to go to the wild. Mm -hmm. So that, I think that's the, the main goal of aquariums mm -hmm. when, we are, yeah. when we have breeding programs. Yeah, so this, this is a good uh, image to show you exactly that. that okay. um, you know, the, the, the future of aquariums is conservation. So yeah. the reason why they exist is because of conservation. And uh, the fact that uh, we are breeding these animals and allowing some of the species to be replenished in the ocean because we have already destroyed those species or those systems, is always a, um, a plus, is always a, a hope that um, we can still, we are still on time to try to solve this crisis that we are facing. Yeah, you are almost convincing me. <laughs> Armin, the stage is yours. You can go through the images and, yeah. you know, and, 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 and just close this session because we um, have stolen some time from you. So, stage is yours. Um, yeah, so, for me, it was also interesting in a certain way that uh, what was uh, regulated very well was uh, not only this fact of the breeding that, in fact, uh, I mean, reproduction also can create some competition, but of course, food can create some competition. And uh, so that there is a very accurate, let's say, um, also kitchen program and that uh, I understood well, almost every species of, of fishes had its own kind of menu. And also, um, 
yeah this uh, is yeah. the kitchen this yeah. is the kitchen in fact the the preparation of of the menu so and that all this was um uh regulated were a very precise routine almost like um yeah in a, in a sports uh, training camp uh, in a certain way and uh, yeah so that that was quite interesting for me and, and I, we were also very interested that we could film this uh, from near and uh, yeah so maybe this picture is also interesting because on top of this of uh, yeah this sphere or this this spaceship you have a little bit like in in the opera house uh, and, uh, yeah the, the backstage where where you understand from from where the light the water and and the scuba divers that enter are, are entering the space um, but maybe maybe you want to to make a final comment on this uh on this picture yeah may i come yeah so the, this is the the top of the the main tank the one you saw on the drawings of the first image and basically this allows us to 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 feed and to observe the animals from 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 the top and uh, many people ask well there is predation within the tank. Some, sometimes there is, but, but it's, it's very few. And the reason is because all the animals are well fed. And we have feed stations for the big groupers. We have feed stations for the sharks. So with some training, and the, the only training that we provide is training to, to make, we, we try as biologists, we try to don't established connections, mm. human connections to the animals, because we believe that we should keep it away from the wild. They should be the, the more natural that can be living in, in captivity, but providing the best conditions to them. Mm. So the only thing that we do is to make sure that it's the minimum necessary to provide their well-being. So, so it and depends on the species. So sharks feed on, in one place, groupers in another. So with these, they know that that fish that is on that place, if I go there, they don't give to me. So I'm not going there anymore. So only the right ones are fed. And it, it, it's like, it, it, it's quite nice because we can control what each fish can eat. And when I'm talking about each fish is the, the ones that are big tellers, sharks, rays, the, the, the larger ones. But, but the biologist has to make sure that everybody from this tank eats. So for sometimes we have to, to, to go and dive and to hand feed some fishes that, that are, or they are very, they are on the bottom, so they, the food don't get to them, or they are not as fast as the other ones and they don't get to the food as easily. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really uh, making sure that every single animal get their own food. So, and yes, the, each one has a, a menu, as Armin was saying. Yeah, it was quite amazing to see how much they are domesticated and, and used to arrive to be uh, fat, for example, or they recognize colors, right? Like yeah. at the red, someone will come, and the yellow, the others will come. So this is very special to see and to observe. Okay, I think we're really um, running out of time right and so yeah there are a lot we we should say eh? <laughs> maybe we can close with this image and armin would you like to comment from your perspective um what are we looking at from your perspective yeah so so for me this is a very interesting images also if it's considered maybe boring or non-spectacular but it really shows the incredible efforts of, of logistic of an aquarium and also, I was interested in this picture because I learned, uh, I, was, I was photographing in, a, in the zoo of Mexico City uh, two, three years ago, uh, where they had a panda. And, and I learned on all the process, for example, for a panda being in a zoo, that uh, it was not real, it was a present from China, but it was a, a loan present. So the panda would still be owned by China. So, so this panda would be, part of a huge uh, 
diplomatic um, um, uh, diplomatic game of uh, of geopolitics in a certain way but also learned that um, yeah that exactly like the louvre or the uffizi um, there is a way to exchange between aquariums uh, the the animals and of course, I mean, some animals are more prestigious than others, exactly like uh, like paintings of, uh, yeah, of Botticelli or, or Da Vinci in a certain way. And, and that there is a, a very sophisticated system uh, of um, catal catal cat making catalogs of, of the animals and, and also about uh, making statistics ab about their um, health uh, so that the, there is a, a really a lot of information and, and standardization exactly like in in art uh, between museums and uh, yeah this was the software that that was interconnecting indeed uh, they call them the collection as we do for art institutions yeah. and museum in general so which is again now part of the vocabulary we use as you also yeah, explain us today. So I think there is a lot uh, to work um, in terms not only of collaboration, and I really wish you can find a way of collaborating as much as possible and to really at one point becoming like, you know, um, partners in crime in a good way. Um, but I would say that we already are. <laughs> yeah, that's true with the Ocean Azul, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I understand. But really to see, to really see in, um, for real that there is um, a, a sort of fluidity um, between a closed world like the Oceanarium and uh, open waters as a marine um, protected area that still are an open <laughs> world and system. And so I really hope that will be this sort of, um, again, connection and collaboration. And at the same time, I think one of the topics of today, uh, not only for us, but also something that we heard before, is really to reformulate vocabulary, right, and terms, and really do these exercises um, about using terms that can uh, properly correspond to new ways of intending our present and future and environment. So is someone... Uh, any question from, from the audience? Otherwise, we go ahead with, okay, Luis. Very quickly, I was just wondering for Manuel, I mean, does it make sense to you as a designer of marine protected areas to look at the use of the term and the term? Are we overplaying the similarities or really? Hmm. Yeah, well, I think that um, the fact that we need to upscale the management systems of MPAs allow us to think that lots of the lessons that we can bring from, if you want, the control rooms of aquariums where we, you need to be aware of all that is going on all the time so that we manage this properly, I think it's a, it's a good image of where we need to go in terms of improving the, the management of these systems. Thank you. Thank you very much. Armin, Miguel, Emanuel, thank you, thank you thank so you. much. <laughs> thank you. Bye, Armin. Bye, Armin. Bye soon. Nice to thank see you. you. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye.